Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Hannigan, Chief Learning Officer at Click. I'm joined today by our good friend Alan Schwartz, a Pulitzer Prize nominated former New York Times reporter and a member of the Data Literacy Project's advisory board. Now we're on to season two of Know Your Data and we've expanded beyond COVID. In this episode, we'll be unpacking the data, graphs, charts, in terms regarding something we're all following these days in the upcoming U.S. presidential election, and that is polling. With that, we'll have Alan get us started. Thanks, Kevin. You know, we all know what a poll is, but what really goes into it and why do they always get so misinterpreted? We all remember 2016 and how the numbers looked before and after the actual election. So let's go through the basics and then apply those basics to the polls and the graphics we are going to be seeing over the next two weeks before the 2020 election. And uh, what we're going to cover is the concept of a random sample and how actually a random sample is not possible. And what are the effects of that? The effects go into what we call the margin of error. There will always be a margin of error. We're going to have some statistical margins of error and then some methodology margins of error, error that we're going to look at. And then we will apply these things to election 2020. And an important lesson you're going to see is that there's a big difference between a poll and a prediction. So stay tuned for that. Now, please, please remember that none of this is an endorsement, any endorsement of an actual candidate or a specific poll. It's just about how polling works in general. So what is the goal in general with polling? Well, we're trying to assess the probability of something happening. Which of two candidates will win the election? And we're trying to get clues, but how many and what type of clues can give us a reasonable estimate with meaningful confidence? Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Alan. So if you're doing a poll, it would be great to just ask everyone in the country who they're going to vote for and just add them all up. But obviously, it's not that simple. That can't happen. We have to choose a smaller number and then extrapolate from there. What often surprises people is that in a two-person election in a large nation like the United States of 300 million people, is you actually need to pull only a tiny random segment of them to get an incredibly accurate prediction of how they would all vote. Well, how tiny? Like 1,000. Only 1,000 respondents would give you a 95% chance of being within a few percentage points. The population could actually be 4 billion. It doesn't actually matter. It's called the law of large numbers. And let's watch how it works in action. Now, let's say we have a huge bin of marbles, actually 300 million of them. And we want to determine what percentage of them are red and what percentage are blue. On the chart, the bottom axis is the number of balls we've chosen, and the left axis is the percentage of balls that have come up red for each poll. So let's try this once. You see in the beginning on polls one and two, the percentage was 1,000. The ball must have come up red both times. But then it jumped to 33% and back up to 50%. Then it shot down to 25%. We must have gotten a bunch of blues. And it stayed down for a while, but then it went back up. After about 400 marbles, we pretty much settled in on a consistent level that didn't change that much. That level was 41%. And after only 400 marbles, now that's the law of large numbers. The further you go, the results will converge around the right number. And we ran the simulation a few times more. And you can see that the early pulls of marbles were scattered. But as you start to get toward 400 marbles, they all start to converge around that 41% mark. Only 400 out of 300 million. And we can be confident we got an accurate idea of what the true percentage was. But how confident exactly? Well, that's the key word, everyone, confidence. We need some confidence that our estimate is close to the true answer. The problem is that polling, this process is really expensive. So we have to decide when we can stop polling and still have an estimate that we can feel confident in. Now we're gonna skip the hardcore math in terms, but in general, pollers stop when the estimate has a 95% chance that the true answer is within three percentage points higher and lower. The other way to look at it is, hey, don't forget, there's a 5% chance that this is pretty wrong. 
But of course, people forget that when they hear that, oh, so-and-so's ahead 52% to 42% or whatever it is. Now, as we saw in our marble experiment, it doesn't take that long for us to feel pretty darn good that our estimate is close to the true percentage. But how close? This is called a confidence interval, and we can watch it in action here on the graphic we just saw. You can see that at the beginning, it's pretty much all over the place. The distance up and down is really high because after four or five or 10 or 15 pulling of marbles, we still can't really know what the percentage is. We need to keep going, and the further we go, the less our margin of error is the less our, our uh, the more narrow our confidence interval. You'll hear that too. And so that's in theory. Now the problem is people are not marbles. In a real world election poll, you can't assess, you can't access thousands of people randomly. You used to get them through landline phones, but many poor voters didn't have phones. And more and more people today have switched to cell phones exclusively, but a ton of them aren't listed. And what about online polls? We found that Democratic and lower income people participate in online polls more. And most polls overall attract older people and college graduates who have their own common leanings when it comes to politics. Different groups of people end up actually voting at all on election day. So it's, it's kind of a mess with all these different groups. Now, according to Pew Research, CNN and Fox News conduct polls by telephone. CBS News and Politico poll online using opt-in panels. And the AP and Pew conduct polls online using a panel of respondents that they recruited offline. And some pollsters use robocalls, and we know how much we all like answering robocalls and then hanging up. So these different approaches, even when they're done in good faith, can really distort our estimate of what's truly going on with public opinion when public opinion has so many different groups that can cross over. And you're gonna take that right now, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Alan. So e even if we could get that random sample, as you said, we know there's various groups of people that tend to vote similarly. People of the same gender, race, the state they live in, the education level, age. Now, each of these groups have different sizes and they cross over each other in different ways and things like that. Now to make sure we get a high enough sample and confidence level for each of those, we need to weight them to try to mimic the national population. That's what's generally called nationally representative sample. You can't really do this with just the four or five groups that we showed on the screen. Polls like those from Gallup and Pew try to calibrate 10 or 12 variables, and that's incredibly hard. So, What's the real output here? What's the real lesson? All of this will add to our margin of error. We had the statistical one of about plus or minus 3% that Alan talked about. All of this other stuff can add maybe another plus or minus 2% to make it five percentage points one way or the other. Now that's not such a big deal when you're polling about say maybe what percentage of the country prefers a tax cut or not. The difference between a 54 and 46 estimate and the actual outcome of 49 to 51 doesn't matter much because ultimately the message is it's about even. But in an election, the final race is often close, maybe 52 to 48, and there is a flat out winner and loser. So that five points one way or another can wind up spectacularly wrong. So, okay, let's take a look at this graphic showing the national poll we currently have between Biden and Trump. The chart shows that currently Biden has a 52 to 43% lead. But this chart doesn't show the margin of error. If we add in the statistical margin of error that Alan talked about, and then the 2% margin of error for the potential sampling issues we just talked about, there's a crossover where even though it looks like Biden's gonna win, there's a meaningful chance that our estimates were wrong enough to have Trump end up winning. And it's exactly what happened in the 2016 election. Many state polls overrepresented college graduates, more undecided voters ending up voting for Trump, and the turnout was higher than expected in rural counties and lower than expected in urban communities. Now, all of these managed to skew those variables slightly enough that we had talked about earlier, which led to this. 
Yeah, that was a pretty big deal uh, here in New York where I live. But, you know, guess what? After all of the consideration of different groups and their crossover nationally, et cetera, et cetera, even after all of that, after we figure out how uncertain national polls can be, the national poll doesn't even really matter. Just because somebody really truly does get 51% of the votes, they don't necessarily win the presidency. In fact, in two of the last five elections, including Trump over Clinton in 2016, the person with the most total votes did not become president. Now, we're going to really simplify an explanation here. So constitutional scholars, step away from your Twitter. The winner is determined by, in the United States presidential election, the winner is determined by who wins which states with the states weighted by their population. So a huge state like Texas has a weight of 38, while teeny tiny Delaware gets three. Now these weights put together add up to 538, which is where the website name came from, and a majority of 538 would be 270. 270 or more makes you the winner. Because the difference between states' weights is huge, we need to consider polls from every single state you know, small, large, estimate the probability of that state's winner, and then mush everything together. And when you do that, you start to see graphics like this, which are really starting to get better. The first line is saying, hey, for the polls where, you know, it, it, with everything considered, the uh, each guy is leading by three or more percentage points, you know, for those states that look pretty good, um, look pretty clear. Biden has 300, would have 335 of these weights, which are called electoral college votes. And then uh, Trump on the right would have 125. And in the middle, it's too close to call, which is a nice thing to say, because we're like, look, the errors, we don't feel confident enough telling you. Now, of course, people want to know the answer. And so the next line is saying, OK, look, Let's ignore the too close to calls, say whatever they say. And when you do that, Biden gets 40 more, Trump gets 38 more. And, you know, we're roughly seeing the same type of majority. Now, what I love is the third line. This is hilarious, where the third line is, hey, if all the state polls are as wrong as they were in 2016, how would this end up? And Biden still wins at 319 to 219. But what I love about that is it really shows humility. It's saying that, look, we need to consider all the different possibilities, you know. And, you know, what's great is that places like 538.com are starting to say, look, just because we sort of see this answer once statically, we need to let all these probabilities interact with each other. And what they do is they run a simulation 40,000 times to say, hey, probabilities have at it. And they actually use the law of large numbers again, because the first two, three, four times, you know, it may be out of whack. But by the time you do 40,000, you're going to have a pretty confident idea of what's going to happen, the probability of things happen. So you're not measuring something like a poll. You're now turning it into a prediction of what might happen, not what will happen, but what might happen. Happen. So let's bring up that graphic that I promised you'd understand by now. You see here the perfect word, Biden is favored to win the election. And when all these things were done, Biden won 87 out of 100 times, Trump won 12 out of 100 times. I'm not sure what happened to the, to the, uh, to the tie, but we'll let that go to the Senate. Um, but the thing is, is that we're not saying who will win. We're saying that what are the chances that each person wins? So when you get back to that uh, headline from the New York Post saying everyone was wrong, that's actually wrong. The general consensus in 2016 among people who were doing it right said that Hillary Clinton had an 83% chance of winning. Well, guess what? The one out of six chance came in and one out of six is not that unlikely and that doesn't mean they're wrong it means that something unlikely happened and you know we don't play russian roulette because one out of six things happen 
okay? And we have to watch out for that. That's something uh, that we really have to look out for in 2020 because you could go in with Biden, you know, being 85% chance to win and hey, 15% chance things happen. Got to watch out for it. Yeah, good points, Alan. So let's go ahead and wrap up with our three key takeaways from the polling episode. The law of large numbers allows you to pull only a tiny random segment of the population to get an incredibly accurate prediction of how they would all vote. However, getting that random sample is impossible. So it always adds a few percentage points of margin of error. It's important to remember the difference between polls versus prediction. Polls don't say who will win. They attempt to assess the probability of which candidate will win the election. Okay, and as a reminder, if you want to discuss this more or want us to cover something you've seen out there in the media online here on Know Your Data, here is where to reach us. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. Please make sure to use the hashtag BeDataBrilliant in your social post. You can also email us at hello at thedataliteracyproject.org. Don't call my landline because I don't have it anymore. For Kevin Hannigan, I'm Alan Schwartz. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.